those don't know me, I'm John Waters. You'll hear people say rain on occasion. My background, I was an Air Force F-16 pilot and now flying the 777 around the world and co-founder of E3 Aviation. But I'm excited to be sitting here with my buddy, Boat Boswell. And before we get going, I always tell, it's kind of a funny story. We had some overlap. It's probably, gosh, it's almost a decade ago. Shh, don't say that part. Yeah, no, he was F-16 instructor pilot. I was learning to fly the F-16, stationed together, and now, small world, we live about 10 minutes apart. Uh, home. So, Boat, thanks for joining me up here. My pleasure. And so today we're gonna to talk a little bit about NORAD, we're talking about intercepting aircraft, what happens if you get intercepted, how you avoid that, maybe some Chinese spy balloon stuff, because I think, I think NORAD had to deal with that. But I wanna jump in just a little bit about your background, what got you involved in aviation and your path into the Air Force. Yeah, so I think like a lot of people that are probably attending the show, we all go to air shows, and um, that's kind of what I grew up doing. My dad's a military pilot, a commercial airliner for uh, Continental and then United. Uh, my grandfather's on both sides flew uh, in the Air Force um, at various points. And so, yeah, just a lot of history in aviation family-wise. And in inevitably, you catch the bug at some point, and that's how I uh, kind of got started. I wanted to join the Air Force. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Uh, and about halfway through college, I got a ride in a uh, uh, F-16. Um, love the airplane now. I hated it then. Uh, sitting in the back seat of one of those in Phoenix, Arizona in April, where it's 105 normal standing at temperature at about 135 on the ramp. It was miserable. Uh, but I got a ride as a cadet and uh, hated every second of it. And then about three months later, I got to ride in a T-37 and loved every second of it. And that flipped my mind and uh, to aviation I went. So here, here I am. Yeah, so F-16 pilot by trade. If you see him walk around, he actually has a Soviet star there on his sleeve, which is non-standard, I think, for most pilots. Can you tell me a little bit about why you have that on there? And Yeah, yeah sure. So um, in the Air Force, the Navy's a little bit different, but in the Air Force, we have aggressor squadrons. And um, throughout my aviation uh, career in, within the Air Force, I was a, a blue, uh, blue pilot, uh, so the good guy, if you will, for the majority of it, but for about a three-year stint uh, in Ielsen Air Force Base in Alaska, I was a aggressor pilot. And so I was able to go out, uh, fly F-16 still, uh, but uh, basically act as if I'm a bad guy for the betterment of the rest of the Air Force. And so I got to replicate various aircraft from around the country, or around the world, excuse me, uh, from various uh, adversary countries, and uh, just had a blast traveling around all the, all of the Pacific, uh, Hawaii, Korea, Japan. Um, we went down to Nellis and Vegas as well to support them, um, but uh, getting to fly around and, and support them uh, to better their training, give them more enhanced training, and uh, learn a little bit more about our threat uh, countries and then be able to go out and teach. Uh, our mantra was no teach, replicate. Uh, and so we have to go learn, become a specialist on uh, some kind of system or aircraft or something like that. So you get a little bit, a little bit more of a deep dive than you would if you were just going to regular uh, combat air force squadron. The thing that always impressed me about aggressors was that knowledge piece and going around that you don't really think about, but there might be, you might be in charge of radars. Chinese radars, yeah. and your job is to know Chinese radars at a very in-depth level, and then pass that knowledge on to the rest of the blue fleet to know how to go out there and counter and fight it. So what was your specialty when you were going through? Uh, I was infrared missiles. So uh, we have you know, the A9 Lima Mike's X's on the uh, US side, uh, but you know, there's archers and adders and all these other types of threat missiles that are out there that we don't normally get a lot of information at uh, or about as uh, blue pilots, but as red pilots, we go out there, we learn and deep dive, we talk to the agencies that collect the information, they dissect it, figure out what the information is used for, and how to best hopefully defeat it in combat. There's a lot that goes into it that's just scratching the surface, but you mentioned IR missiles, which I think might be a great segue. If anyone's seen the Chinese spy balloon uh, saga that's gone on, those were shot down with AIM-9Xs, infrared missiles, so your current job is not flying F-16s, but you are tied into the North American Aerospace Defense, correct? That's correct, yeah, Nor NORAD, North, Amer North American Aerospace Defense Command. It's a mouthful, that's why we shorten it. Uh, it's a binational command, uh, which means that we also work with our Canadian partners to the north uh, to defend North America, Alaska, and in the Puerto Rico, uh, and the U.S. Virgin Islands within the Caribbean. Uh, Hawaii is on their own. They've got their own mission uh, to defend that piece of uh, land, um, but that, you know, the majority of North America is what we are covering. And uh, our job is to protect the aerospace domain within that uh, territory. 
um, all the way out to the ADIS, the Air, Dis Air, Dis Base, uh, Air Defense Identification Zone. And we utilize um, aircraft from around the country at typically National Guard units. Um, and they will go out and uh, sit alert and respond to any aircraft that traditionally violate temporary flight restrictions or the uh, air defense identification zone. Um, but obviously, uh, balloons are, are included in the uh, aviation category, and so hence why they became popular. Can you tell me a little about the structure of air defense inside the United States? We mentioned guard units. Some people might not know exactly where people are sitting alert, what their responsibilities are when they sit alert. Can you talk to me about how that structure is a little bit? Yeah, definitely. So um, within the United States uh, military structure, specifically in the airspace, uh, the Air Force side, we have the active duty Air Force, we have the Air National Guard, and we have the Air, Res Air Force Reserves. Uh, and we typically use the Air National Guard to sit alert. And we have, I, I want, I'll, I'll just say about 15 locations around the country. Sometimes some sit, you know, come up temporarily or something like that. Um, but we have uh, a unit in Massachusetts, uh, we have a unit in uh, Florida near just south of Miami and Homestead. Uh, we have units in Fresno, California, uh, Riverside, California, Houston, all over the place. And um, we have F-16s, uh, F-15Cs, and F-22s that support the mission on a regular basis. Um, and they will sit alert 24-7 at their home units, and they will fly, depending on where we need them to be, uh, potentially all the way across the country, all the way across Canada, because uh, we have CF-18s in Canada that are also supporting the mission. Those are all active duty Canadian Air Force uh, folks there. And then we have units up in Anchorage, Alaska uh, that sit alert um, as well. So yes, yeah, very widespread. Um, and they will uh, have tanker support if they need it. We have some alert tankers that stand by. And then uh, the E3, the AWACS, uh, we have those standing by as well. Uh, typically, uh, we are really focused on the air defense ident identification zone, the ADIS. Uh, up and down the east west coast and then across the northern border of Canada uh, and then uh, also internally we have the temporary flight restrictions the TFRs and usually it's more presidential or like the Super Bowl or something of that nature major events that would have uh, potentially a lot of people kind of in the same space uh, and those will be all defended we call them a defended or security TFRs um, and those will have aircraft that are signed to support uh, our mission which is keeping everybody safe so I never had to sit alert which was a blessing in my opinion, nor go fly in a cap, because that's one thing too with temporary flight restrictions, especially presidential TFRs, it is not uncommon to have airborne assets. So when I was at Shaw, that was one of the taskings where guys would fly eight, nine hour missions on a routine basis, intercepting Cessnas or whatever plane might be unaware that there's a TFR, and unfortunately they violate that TFR and get intercepted. Can you talk to me about, I guess, some of the pro tips to one, avoid getting intercepted, and then two, if you do get intercepted, what, what do you need to do? Absolutely, yeah, so everything really comes down to the foundational pieces of what you learned when you were beginning as a general aviation pilot. Um, mission planning or flight, flight planning, um, looking at the NOTAMs, uh, all of the information that is involved in the TFR process is in the NOTAMs, and you can go find that information via the FAA's websites. Um, but that is where we try to send people to start. Let's get some really good quality flight planning so we have the awareness at the start, or at least as high as possible. Um, we have other tools now that we didn't have probably when you and I were learning to fly. Uh, you've got your iPads with ForeFlight and all the other types of uh, software companies that are making those you know, situation awareness enhancing tools. Um, but your charts there on the, on the iPads are probably updating on a regular basis. Uh, so we just ask that everybody before they launch and fly, that they update that, make sure they have the most current information and go look at the TFR notums, the regular uh, aviation notums. And then depending on where you are in the country, because there are certain areas of the country, specifically Washington, D.C., uh, that have different uh, kind of flight rules, if you will, uh, that you need to adhere to and potentially some training that you have to do ahead of time to be certified or qualified to fly in that airspace. Yeah, thanks. What are some of the best stories you've heard coming out of these alerts, intercepts? Do you have any good ones? Uh, other than the balloon thing, um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of pilots that just kind of trundle into spaces that have, have absolutely no clue. And it's not so much like that part of it, it's not so much the part on the, in the air, it's what happens after that uh, we get a lot of kind of funny stuff going on. So all of, all of our F-16s and the F-15Cs uh, have uh, sniper pods on them. So they're uh, video capable, infrared capable pods that can zoom in and look at things on the ground. We use those in combat, so we're very, you know, adept at using those things. 
Um, and so uh, part of our procedures at the very end, and uh, we'll you know, probably talk about it here in a second, but we're going to do a demonstration uh, or display uh, this afternoon around 4.30. We're the final, show, uh, final event today at the show um, that uh, will go through the three kind of passes that you would expect to have if you were flying or being intercepted. Um, and the final one is, as long as you're complying, um, we're going to take you to the nearest available piece of concrete and have you land, um, and then you'll be met by forces of some kind, whether it's security, uh, secret service, uh, the FBI, local police, it just depends on what's available in the local area. Um, and so it's what happens after that when you get guys on the ground that uh, just, just people quite aren't, aren't quite right in the mind sometimes. And it's, it's a very shocking experience, and hopefully by doing this education, getting a little more exposure to it, the general aviation population won't be so surprised uh, when somebody shows up on their left wing and they weren't expecting him. The only story I have, which is not mine, but a buddy's who intercepted someone down here in Florida. And obviously an F-16 can't go very slow very well, but there are some techniques they can do. This plane ducked into a fly-in community. By the time he came back around and actually was using his sniper pod, using that, that targeting pod with the infrared version to see the heat signatures, as he found the one hot plane, all the Secret Service, all the law enforcement came rolling up. So it turns out there's a lot of things out there that are uh, looking at you and, and tracking you. Can you talk to me what happens if you see a fighter show up in your wing? What, what can someone expect and what do they need to do? Yeah, so the first thing, uh, do everything as normal as possible, all right? We don't want you to do anything that is unsafe. So don't dive for the ground, don't make an aggressive turn uh, you know, towards the aircraft or away from the aircraft. Just remain predictable, be as safe as possible. If it looks like it's gonna be a violation of an uh, aircraft limit, don't do it. We want you to remain safe, stay within your aircraft uh, uh, limits. Um, and then try to get in touch with that fighter aircraft. So normally you should be talking to air traffic control. If you have two radios, we ask that the first, the primary radio, be talking to air traffic control. The secondary radio is uh, your guard frequency, 121.5, and you want to monitor that the entire time, because that's what that fighter aircraft off your left wing is gonna be using to try to talk to you. Um, you'll see them show up on the left wing because that's where normally the main pilot in the aircraft is going to be sitting on the left side, so it's the easiest uh, vantage point to see the fighter aircraft. Uh, and you'll see them rock their wings, and we're just looking for you to acknowledge it via thumbs up, rock your own wings, something to acknowledge that that aircraft is there, um, and then immediately switch over to 121.5 as your primary communications frequency and start talking to that aircraft. Uh, that aircraft has multiple radios on it, and they're also going to be talking to air traffic control at the same time. And so once you acknowledge that uh, aircraft is there, uh, then they're going to start to talk to air traffic control and get vectors to whatever airspace they need to take you to. Um, when, if you're still not talking to them, maybe you went in ordo, maybe your radios quit or something, um, then they're going to use visual signals from that point forward uh, to communicate what they would like you to do. And the first thing they want you to do is probably turn away from wherever it is that you are. Uh, so if you find yourself, you know, a, a temporary flight restriction is about a 30 mile ring. Uh, and then within that 30 mile ring is a 10 mile ring all based off of the thing that they are defending. And so they don't want you to get anywhere close to that 10 mile ring. That is a no fly period dot. Uh, outside of 10 miles up to 30 miles, you can transit legally as long as you follow the procedures. Uh, so talk to air traffic control, squawk the appropriate frequency and uh, follow the flight plan that you've been filed on. Uh, but if you're not for some reason, uh, let's say you go Nordo, uh, then they're gonna use uh, those visual signals to move you away from that defended airspace, which could be a turn left or a turn right um, depending on how, how close you are uh, and how much you are pointed directly towards the thing that they're defending. Uh, so you'll see them turn away from you, and that is your indication, hey, let's follow them. Now, you're probably flying a Cessna or, or you know, a Diamond or something like that, right? We're not gonna fly as fast as an F-16. That's okay. Just follow them, point your nose in the direction of where they're going, and do your best. Again, don't violate anything uh, limits-wise in your aircraft and remain safe and predictable. Safe and predictable, I think that's the key thing because if you have a fighter show up on your wing, that's probably a significant emotional event for anyone, I would imagine. Absolutely. Uh, and not somewhere you want to be, so just staying calm and safely operate your aircraft is, a, I think, a huge takeaway there. Again, being predictable, safe and predictable, that's huge. I want to open up to a question. I know we have a couple of people sitting here in just a minute, but before we do that, can you talk to me what you're doing here, what people can expect to see, and then if they want more information where they can find it. Yeah, definitely. All right, so uh, our website is uh, www.norad.mil slash general dash aviation. Uh, we try to make it as long as humanly possible, but <laughs> hopefully it sticks in your brain. Uh, but we have all of our briefing and some additional supporting documentation on the website that you all can go look at, download. We have a, a smart card that we have uh, that you can put on your knee while you go fly. It's double-sided, you print it off at home. 
um, and uh, can use that. It's got how to plan properly. It's got all the website locations for NOTAMs and TFRs and everything else like that. Plus on the back side, it has all the intercept procedures that we've taken from the ICAO uh, documentation that's current. Um, and you can use that on the fly if you see a visual signal that you don't understand. Realize intercepts also have at nighttime. So there's some light signals that are gonna be a, a potential factor as well. Uh, so again, reference the card and then do the, do the right thing, remain predictable. Um, what we're doing here at the show is we do this exact thing. We come out, we educate and retrain general aviation pilots to hopefully prevent an intercept from ever having to happen. Uh, we estimate that on average about $100,000 per uh, aircraft uh, every time we launch an aircraft to go intercept somebody. That's how much your tax dollars are having to pay uh, to do this. So that little bit of knowledge ahead of time could save a lot of taxpayer dollars uh, in the long run. Uh, that being said, um, we're going through the process of explaining what the intercepts look like, feel like, and what you're supposed to do in response to them uh, to hopefully prevent the worst thing possible, which is potentially having to be shot down. We've never had to shoot anybody down. We don't want to shoot anybody down, um, but that's why we're here. We're trying to prevent something like that from happening in the future. Awesome. Are there any questions before we wrap up here? I don't want to cheat anyone out of some time with boat. Yes, sir. The which thing? Ad camps. Is that an acronym? Crop oh. dusters. Oh. Okay. Repeat the question, please. Yeah. Um, so all the uh, agricultural aircraft that are flying around that don't necessarily have radios or transponders or something to that effect. Um, so uh, depending on the airspace that we are defending, they will have different assets available to identify aircraft um, and to include crop dusters or th the like that don't necessarily talk to uh, air traffic control on a regular basis. Um, so the general rule of thumb, if you're flying an aircraft in the air, we expect that you're t you know, reviewing the NOTAMs, looking for TFRs that potentially pop up here and there. There are some places, especially where the president's you know, living in Delaware and on the East Coast, that you would expect the TFR to be. Um, but if there's a, you know, a convention, a Super Bowl or something, that's gonna be a, a TFR that's not typically there. And so we want people to continually review the NOTAMs and everything every single time they go fly because you never know when one's gonna pop up. They should be up about 48 hours or more prior to when the event's gonna happen. Inevitably, there's gonna be some things that are last minute that we're just gonna be able to un you know, unavoidably have to post later, but I'd say about 99% of the time, they're up there at least 48 hours prior. So everybody should have ample time to review the NOTAMs and to identify where those are. Uh, but the same as procedures um, apply, regardless of whether you have a radio, you're a crop duster, you're a military aircraft or whatever, if you're in an airspace that you're not supposed to be in and you're not following the right procedures, they're gonna come find you. Uh, and then just realize for, for especially the presidential TFRs, anything that Secret Service is supporting, it's not just aircraft that are um, supporting the defense of that airspace. There are a lot of ground assets on the, on the ground as well that will uh, help to alleviate uh, the threat, if, if you will. Yeah, that's a great question. Something that I think about, but I've never flown a crop duster, but I would imagine not, not crop dusters, but it might be something you're not always checking the notams because you're just puts around, or not puts around, you're zipping around just your local area yeah. frequently. So we get, that, we get that a lot. We get that a lot of people saying, well, I just fly around my, my own airport and stuff all the time. Like, okay, that's great. But you still have an obligation. So. Yeah, and then just go around, around Robin. So any other questions before we wrap up? Awesome. Boat, thanks for joining us here. It was great to talk to you again. Look forward to doing it again soon. Yeah, thanks so much, man. Appreciate it. Cheers.